Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, I would like to thank the, peop uh, the board of APDF for the honor that they've given me. It is very humbling, and uh, I must say that it's been a long journey. I remember the first meeting of the APDF which I attended was the first APDF meeting, and that too was held in Chennai years back. I was a young man then. Uh, and it's always good to be here again with my friends, and uh, a lot of my friends have always worked with me and been with me in Diabetes India and through a lot of other ups and downs, and I am really, really thankful to them personally and to APDF as a whole for this thing. Now, let me start off by talking about what I'm going to speak on, and that is the diabetes scenario. Very frankly, let me tell you that I'm not going to tell you anything really new. But I think there comes a time in everybody's life when they have to sit back and think as to where we are, where we have gone, and where we are planning to go. Because that, in a way, is very, very important for what all of us are doing in life, and that is trying to deal with this problem of diabetes. The question first comes in is controlling the tsunami, and in, because we live in India, I always like to say, is it in our stars or is it in our hands? A lot of people in India believe that, well, what's going to happen is going to happen, and what can we do about it? But I seriously feel that a lot of it is in our hands, and I think this rising tsunami that we have, there's something that we can do, in fact, we must do. The question is, what and why have we not done it? And that is what I would like to uh, talk on today. Now, basically, you all know, this is an old slide uh, which showed the diabetes, the new epidemic, and it also showed that India would be the diabetes capital of the world. This was a very old slide from 1998. Then, in 2004, it was shown that India had 31.7 million people with diabetes and was much more than China. But the figure that I want you to see is this, 366. It was postulated that by the year 2030, there would be 366 million people with diabetes in the world. The 366 million people with diabetes in the world, the figure was reached in 2011. And now it is postulated that it would reach 550 million people by about 2030. And that is the whole point. That the tsunami is ongoing, ongoing, and just keeps on increasing. Because we've, as I will show you here, the other thing what we saw was that China, in fact, had overtaken India. India had 61.3 million, while China had 90 million. And I always tell my Chinese friend that, look, that's one gold medal. I don't mind losing to you any time you want. You take it away. In fact, I wouldn't want the silver medal, the bronze medal, or any medal if it is possible. The thing really is this, that we have reached a stage where things are just going out of hand. And you know all this. The problem is this. We, we see all this, the onset of diabetes, the insulin secretion going up and down. But look at this. The problem that I am bothered about is the fact that microvascular complications of diabetes occur at the time of onset of diabetes. Now remember, the onset of diabetes is something which is very different from when they are diagnosed with diabetes. So the person may have diabetes for many years and not even know about it. So therefore the whole point is the microvascular complications already started and in fact the macrovascular complications have started even much before the person is overtly diabetic. That is the problem. <coughs> so somebody started the concept of the ticking clock. The clock has already started ticking as far as the problems of diabetes are concerned and what do we do about it and how do we stop the clock. First of all, why bother about diabetes? Well, you see that uh, we've made tremendous strides. Let's be very frank about it. We know a lot more about diabetes. We have lots better drugs available, hopefully. But then the whole problem is that if that is so, why is it that the number of people with diabetes, the number of people with early heart disease just keeps on increasing all the time? And that is the whole problem. Why? And what is the problem? Look at this. The diabetes in India, I think all of you know this, so I'm not going to take too much time. But diabetes is being seen in increasing numbers. It is being increasingly diagnosed in people in younger age groups. I know when we were students, uh, we were residents also. Type 2 diabetes, well, 40, 45 years old, fine. Now we see 15, 16, 18 year old people with type 2 diabetes. The problems, are, the complications are occurring earlier and are progressing much faster. And look at this. Diabetes is the largest cause of non-traumatic lower limb amputations, the largest cause of blindness. 
One in three people undergoing dialysis are those with diabetes. 80% of diabetes patients will die of an early heart disease. And in fact, by the time all of you have read this, one person will have died from diabetes-related complications and two will have had a diagnosis. That is how bad the problem is. <coughs> now, this is a problem that is typical of India. It's a major problem and people, believe me, it is something that we have, unfortunately, we all talk of the data, we all talk of the numbers, we all talk of the figures, but what are we doing about it? Today, as president-elect of the International Diabetes Federation, I have to take lectures in huge many number of countries. Do you really think it is right that we, or I feel good to tell them that, well, this is it, there's such a major problem, because somebody always asks me, and what are you doing about it? And very frankly, if you think back also, we really don't have much of an answer for that. And today is a question that I am putting to you and also to me, that think back as to we have a massive problem of diabetes, we have a massive problem with the morbidity and the mortality of diabetes, what are we doing about it? That's the whole thing. It's all very well, according I always maintain, to get new knowledge and attend conferences and read books and read journals and have big discussions. But at the end of the day, remember one thing, people, that whether we are doing something or not can only be judged by the fact of one thing, are we making a difference to that person in the life of that person with diabetes or not? If we are not making a difference, then I think the point really is we have to sit back and wonder what is the use of all our knowledge, what is the use of all our treatment facilities, what is the use of anything that we do if we are not able to make a difference in the lives of our people with diabetes. Something obviously went wrong somewhere, so where do we go? Now, <coughs> it's all very well to talk in terms of empowerment of our people with diabetes offering them optimal care which is available, that's fine, accessible, remember 75% of India still lives in the rural areas, so it has to be accessible and of course affordable, okay. Education of the caregivers, and this is something I will come to a little later, primary and secondary prevention. What is the medical scenario in India? Now I'll tell you one thing, I may think I'm a big shot diabetologist and there I see people here who are very much uh, uh, bigger shot diabetologists and endocrinologists than I am. But remember one thing, that 95 to 98 percent of our people are seen by primary care physicians and only by primary care physicians, okay? So it, they're not seen by us all the time. And therefore the question comes in is that when we talk of primary care physicians, remember, we're not even talking only of allopathic doctors, we're talking of all of them including RMPs. Secondly, as far as allopathy, all the things are changing now, remember that you may have passed 50 years back, your knowledge may be old, but the point is nobody knows whether you are really have kept up with the knowledge or not. The point again, and 75% of India lives in the rural areas, the point I want to ask you is, how is it, what are we doing to see that those 90%, 95% of the people who are treated by primary care physicians are getting good treatment, optimal treatment, forget best treatment. I'm talking of acceptable treatment. And what are we doing about it? See, we all keep talking about these consensus guidelines and this was published here and this is published there and we meet here and I see people having huge discussions on HbA1c 6 or 5.5 or 6.5 or 7. For God's sakes, people, it makes damn all difference to most of our people with diabetes because they're nowhere near 7. That's the thing. And this is the point that I uh, we'd never make. See, we talk in terms of hit the target, 7, 6.5 or is it 7? Suppose it is 5.7, we don't know. But remember one thing, why don't we tell people that look, decrease in the risk with 1% decrease in HbA1c, which is what, 30, 35 milligram percent? Look at how much it decreases. Diabetes related endpoints decrease by 21%, myocardial infarction by 14%, stroke by 12% and microvascular complications by 37%. So my point is this, that why don't some of us go out and tell the primary care physicians, look, I'm not concerned whether you really can bring it down to six or seven because frankly, I know I can't most of the time. But the point is, even if your patient is at 200, 250 blood sugar, bring it down to 200, bring it down by 30, 35, 40, and you will have a tremendous decrease in the, this thing. But we don't do that. We only tell them how they must control everything, but then don't let the patient go into hypoglycemia, because otherwise that's a bad problem. What is the poor primary care physician going to do? He is sitting 
and looking at 50 types of illnesses and 50 patients coming to him one after is he really going to bother about all this no after a while he says okay let's just do what we can do and forget about it that is not the way i want the treatment of diabetes to be now in an ideal world of course all of us would be going out and all the primary care physicians would be sending all their patients to us and they would also be experts in managing diabetes and everybody would be at good optimal control and there would be nobody having uh, any problems any morbidity or a mortality with diabetes but we don't live in an ideal world you know that i know that the question is what do we do and one of the things that i always feel is that i think it's time for us to yes learn everything else but for god's sakes let us do some initiatives which have clinical uh, imperative for example is clinically relevant initiatives do we come down from the ivory towers up there and see what are we doing about the poor men on the ground that's the whole point that i want to make to you today that my knowledge is nothing i agree there are lots of people here who have much more knowledge than me but the question is this that what is the use of all that knowledge why is it that we have done nothing really nothing okay there may be individual instances here and there of people helping out and doing that but on the whole what have we really done to make things to make the primary care physicians a lot more alert as to how to manage diabetes how to manage lipids how to manage hypertension how to prevent the complications none of us do that yet we will keep attending all our conferences go to the esd go to the ada go to the idf go to this attend 25 conferences in india the problem is when we uh, attend conferences or when we even sort of have these conferences do we ask ourselves that from the last conference to this conference what have we really done that has made a difference none of us ask in fact people are already talking about where the next esd is and where the next ada will be held and where the next uh, uh, apdf will be held the question is what in between is the role of all these organizations just to hold conferences is that what we are there for in which case then i don't think it's worth attending these meetings the question is you learn something yes you learn something but what are you going to do with that knowledge are you going to translate it so that it benefits the person the people with diabetes if not very frankly we can meet 25 years down the line and we'll still be talking the same thing oh the tsunami is there and this is there and this is there but now we've got fantastic evidence fantastic things to do you know you can just sniff a little and insulin will come up and glucagon will go down and your all your glucose will pass out in the urine and everything will be there the problem is fine all of that will be there but why the number of people with diabetes dying all of a sudden it's seven percent uh, seven per second is going to remain seven per second it doesn't make sense at all and that is what i want to do <coughs> importantly do not forget to kiss i always maintain this it's not something that i want to really talk about what do i mean by kiss keep it scientifically simple that's the point when we take our lecture care physicians and even for a lot of general physicians we tend to make things very very complicated and that is uh, i don't know why I think it just shows a problem on our part that we want to show off what our great knowledge is rather than see to it how are we going to give that knowledge to the people so that they can, it can be useful for them. Now I'll tell you this is a short, this thing we did of Diabetes India. We surveyed a thousand randomly selected diabetes patients from about a hundred primary care physicians in Bombay. 79% had this, 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 but look at this. 86% had atherogenic dyslipidemia and or a raised LDLC. Okay, so what we did was we told them, we told the primary care physicians in just one session, we told them, look, the important thing is LDLC has to be brought down unless the triglycerides are more than 500, in which case bring the triglycerides down, otherwise bring the LDLC down, then look at the triglycerides, and most of the time the HDL will take care of itself. These are the targets we gave them. <coughs> This is what I told you. And we told them about management strategies and lifestyle changes. Now, we didn't go into telling them about omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids and PUFAs and PUFAs and SUFAs and MUFAs. What we did was we tell them, tell your patients, for God's sakes, to just cut down the amount of oil that they use in their uh, cooking by about 50%. And you think it doesn't work? I'll tell you. What we did was we worked with the nutrition department of University of Baroda. And we took 10 recipes from every state in India, 200 recipes. There are more states, I agree. But from 20 states. 
and they modified it to cut the amount of fat down, the cal everything down by about 50%. And we had a blind testing done with people. And we found that people just could not, in fact, make a difference out. In fact, a lot of people felt that the uh, low fatty uh, food, the low oily food was much tastier. So that is the question is that this is what we told them, just cut the thing down. Don't go into PUFAs and MUFAs and SUFAs. Rule out secondary causes, common hypothyroidism. And the medications, again, we didn't really go and tell them, but we told them about statins, for God's sakes. A statin a day keeps the doctor away. So use the statins. What would be the side effects, we told them. And look at this. We did a subsequent study on 1,000 randomly selected patients of those same primary care physicians. And 61% only had uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia. Now, I'm not saying that 61% is a very good figure. It's still very, very high. But compared to 86%, all it took was one simple lecture for one and a half hour to the primary care physicians and then we had no contact with them for one year until we again went to them and took about a hundred thousand random patients and found this out. So that is what, what I'm trying to say is that very simple and when you take the lectures you know what they tell you doc thank God for what you did because people come and tell me when they're talking of lipids they come and tell me about apolipoprotein B100 and apolipoprotein A3 and C1 and B4 is that for God's sakes I don't want to be an expert on apolipoproteins I've got 50 patients with 50 illnesses coming to me I cannot be an expert in everything just tell me what I should do when a person walks in and why is it not possible for all of us and I tell you even your organization I asked the executive board of the APDF what is it stopping you from taking the knowledge out to the primary care physicians in, in Andhra Pradesh and see whether it makes a difference or not? Why is it just that, you know, we can sit here and again next year, I don't know where the conference is, I was told about it already, uh, and discuss again the latest advances in lipid research. But in between, I would like somebody to get up and say that, look, we did this and it made a little difference. I'm not saying we're going to solve the problem, but why are we not making a difference? It is possible sometimes to reach the target. But so my point again is this, is this the way forward? Now this is one of the things I think of. I'm sure a lot of you, if you sit back and think, will come up with other ideas which can help. Because here it says, for example, uh, he, he'd ask God, do you think he, God would know about it? But he says he's not sure either. Well, the problem really is that maybe there is no one answer. This is what I feel, but the question is I'm willing to look at what other people feel. But for that, for you all to be able to tell us, you have to think about it as to what is going on and what is going wrong. Let us not play the blame game. Everyone will discuss, you know, we have been sitting and discussing. Blame the government, simple. Hey, come on, the government is doing nothing. There's no advocacy. They're just putting in 2.4% of the GDP on health care and all that is going to acute care and what is the government doing? Blame the pharma companies. You know, they are all doing all this. The medicines are very costly, etc., etc. Blame the society for the way they live. Blame the patient, I'll come to that. But blame the doctors? Never. How can we? I mean, we are doctors. How can we ever have any problems, do anything wrong? But the problem is, what we do is we love the patients and I'll tell you why we ourselves forget what we do. That is one aspect of what we don't do about empowering the primary care physicians, but our very own approach. Now, I'm not saying that uh, uh, this is something that happens even here. Maybe it does, but I can tell you from experience of what happens in Bombay or Mumbai as they call it now. And one of the biggest things that doctors always tell is, why do patients not follow my lifestyle advice? We all know that lifestyle management is very important, but would you follow this diet advice? I, we did a study again, although this is again older, but it happens even. What happens very often when the patient goes to the doctor? Avoid eating the, eat less. Avoid sugar, avoid sweets, avoid fruits, avoid rice and potatoes, avoid oil, ghee, butter, oil, fried foods. Avoid meat products, especially red meats. Avoid all foods with a high cholesterol content. Avoid saturated fats. This is exactly what the patient feels after that. Okay? Look at this. This is a friend of mine, Glassbergen. And the four basic food groups are don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat those, and don't eat that other stuff also. <laughs> I gave up sugar, fat, cholesterol, alcohol, tobacco, carbohydrates, and proteins. And now you want me to give up air and water also? My doctor says I can lose weight if I just eliminate two things from my diet, food and drink. 
And remember, this, these are people making fun of the doctors. They're not making fun of themselves, please. Because some of the advice that we give them is absurd. You give, don't do, don't, 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 all this. Obviously, he gets tense. So then you take his blood pressure. And it's a little high, obviously, it's tense because you've told, stopped him from eating everything. So it's a little high, so tell him no salt also. So avoid this, avoid this, avoid this, avoid salt. Do you really blame them? And it happens in Bombay, let me tell you. And, or of course, it's the other way around. You know, these big shot uh, diabetologists or endocrinologists, you go to their, uh, this thing, and uh, there are two pretty young ladies sitting there, and they ask you, the dietitians or whatever, and they ask you, sir, what did you eat last night? Now, to be very frank with you, I don't remember what I had for breakfast today. But I'm on the wrong side of 60, young ladies asking me, so you try and tell them something. <laughs> then they give you a book. For the next one week, you must write everything you eat and how much you eat. Now, you know that after a week, you're going to see them again. So for one week, you go like those, uh, you know, those uh, people in Bombay who move around with those uh, weighing scales when they take your old papers and raddiwalas, as they call it, and you write down everything, whatever. You go a week later, and not that they really look at it, but they put it away, and then they give you a diet chart. And what is the diet chart? For example, it's like this. Morning bed tea, one cup of tea with a little milk but no sugar. Breakfast, one slice bread, plain or toasted, weighing approximately 23 grams. One egg boiled, whatever, it goes on like this. Until all this four Mari biscuits only are equivalent, same as for lunch. And what is it? If you eat rice, 100 grams cooked, 40 grams uncooked. So you have to be careful about that. And then the best thing is, total quantity of oil or ghee to be used for the whole day should be limited to three teaspoons. Now I ask you people, is it possible for anybody to follow this diet and remain sane? I, I, I remember I telling my professors, look, it's not possible. He said, no, no, of course it's possible. And uh, I asked uh, the professor's wife, and she said, yeah, okay. Now I asked my wife about it. Uh, yeah, we had been married a year. Now she would have thrown me out, but at that time we had just been married for a year and she told me, and I told her that if I came to you with such a diet chart, uh, would you f do it for me? And she tells me, Shaukat, I'll tell you one thing. I was stupid enough to marry you, but now if you can find anybody else stupid enough to do this for you, I'll give you permission to marry her also. Go ahead. No problems. The pri my thing is, why are we doing this? Are we not able to tell the person, avoid sugar, avoid the oily food, cut down, exercise a little more? I mean, we doctors are not ones who have common sense. The world has common sense. Uh, isn't it true? So just tell them what is good for them. When they come for follow-up, follow it up. Otherwise, what happens is you tell them everything, you blame them, and then, of course, the thing is, you know that sometimes you have a patient who's followed all your advice. You've told him all the stupid things to do. He's done it. You told him all the medicines to take, he's done that also. And after 10 years, 15 years, you tell him, you know something, I think you have a bit of an eye problem. I think you better do these tests and come. And he comes after two weeks and he brings somebody else along with him. He said, you know, this is my cousin brother. He's for 25 years, uh, he's got diabetes, but he's never, uh, he's uh, sort of doesn't really obey anybody. So I made him do all the tests also. So you look at the tests and they're all fine. And his tests are a bit of a problem. And this is the patient will look at you and say, you know what he told me? He said, you idiot, you got into a problem because you went to a doctor. That's the problem. <laughs> this is the thing. My point is, for God's sakes, first of all, please stop saying that you treat diabetics. You do not treat diabetics, you treat people with diabetes. And try and understand that whatever advice you give them, whatever, especially about lifestyle, for God's sakes, is it doable? Does it make sense? That's the whole point. Otherwise, it's all very well to tell them, don't, 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 and that's a blame. Fine, it's a blame game. You blame them, they'll blame you. You blame the government, you blame the pharma companies, and everyone will sit and decide and blame everybody else. But what has happened to that person with diabetes? He's got problems, people. And that is what we have to look into. And that is a point that I think you need to talk and think about. For example, if God wanted us to count calories, he would have put calculator buttons on our tongues. And then we wonder why patients give all our diet advice and half the things they don't listen to us and say, Abhi jana to padega hai, but don't have to listen to him too much, you know, just get, take his signature and come back. At the same time, I know that there are patients who are problematic. I don't want to take names here, 
but I have friends here who, if you tell them have only one glass of uh, uh, wine a day, this is what they do. <laughs> but the doctor told my husband, this is what my wife always maintains. The doctor told my husband to double his physical activity, so now he changes channels with both hands. Walking the dog. And this, the next one is taken from a very, very costly gym next to my house. Can you find out what's wrong? <laughs> They're all going to the gym. They all will go up by the escalator and no one will climb that little steps. That's the problem. And it's not funny because I know I work in Jaslok Hospital. Many of you know Jaslok Hospital. At one time it was the five-star, seven-star hospital. And our OPD is on the second floor. Now, believe me, the floors are small, so it's nothing great. But I've seen patients every day. Why patients? I've seen doctors also just waiting and screaming and shouting, the lift will not come. How long does it take? For God's sakes, two floors, you can't climb up. But no, that's not something done because that's the whole problem. And therefore, like they say, that at one time our problem was uh, malnutrition. At one time, yes, it was malnutrition. Now it is malnutrition, M-A-L-L nutrition also. So it's not a problem at all. In any case, the road ahead, like I said, coming back is not easy. Nobody said it is easy. But we have a massive problem, which I hope you agree with me, and we have to do something about it. The road is not easy. <coughs> but. <coughs> But Einstein once said that bad things happen not because of bad people. Bad things happen because good people are not willing to do something about it. And therefore, I seriously believe that most of us are basically good people. And I think we need to sort of get together and decide and find out as to what is it that we are supposed to do which will make the lives of our people with diabetes better. People, that at the end of the day, remember, is, is what this whole thing is all about. I'm not saying it's easy, it's a long, long thing, it's going to be very difficult, but like I said in the morning, and something that has always remained with me, ever since my father told me once is, that before you start something, as what Gandhi once said, before you start, and Mahatma Gandhi, please, these days you have to make sure which Gandhi you're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I'm talking of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, he said that, uh, before starting on any initiative, think of the most vulnerable and the most poor person that you know of. And if what you are doing is going to make that person's life better, then that has to be done, irrespective of the cost and the consequences. And I ask you people, that don't you think that the life of a person with diabetes, and don't think of the rich man who is, knows everything and will fly off to uh, Jocelyn Clinic to take an appointment. I'm not talking of that person. I'm talking of the average person in India with diabetes. And don't you think it's time for us to do something rather than just sit around gathering knowledge or blaming each other or blaming the patients? Remember, working together, whether it's the government, whether it's the press, whether it's the media, all of us, we can make a difference. Look at this. It's just that we have to work together, but for us to work together, we have to understand that we have a problem and we have to do something about it and find out. Like I said, I showed you only one thing that I think should be done. I'm sure all of you all can come up with different things. And India is such a large country, such a diverse country, that maybe what works here may not work 100 miles out of here. And that is something that we need. We need inputs from people on the ground and what should be done so that we can do something for the people with diabetes. It is in our hands so that one day, maybe you, uh, it's a problem that you said, you've got a rare condition called good health and I frankly don't know what to do about it. That's what doctors should do. And uh, maybe, who knows, one day things may become better if all of us work together. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but then like I said, that a journey of a million miles starts with a small step and I think it's time for us to take that small step all together. And hopefully one day, maybe 100 years down the line when they meet and somebody wants to discuss diabetes, people will say, oh, come on, what an idiot. Diabetes, what a, we, can, we know how to solve it. And it may be something uh, like this. Either they're not interested or whatever. And I always show this picture because that's my granddaughter. Gone to sleep. She doesn't listen to me even now, but that's okay. The point is that's the attitude that should be there. What idiot. Such a minor problem he's talking about. But for that to happen, we have to work together now. And that is what I want 
you all to do. That is what I think we should do and all of us should do together. So please, it's not Diabetes India, it's not IDF, it's not uh, APDF. All of us working together as equals, looking at what is required, looking at what is the problem, at the end of the day, making a difference. Thank you.